week. So I'll be covering tree risk assessment. And I am a very, um, I'm a list maker. I'm also kind of a uh, methodical one step leads to another step, leads to another step. And I think that really works well for tree risk assessment. And for this presentation anyway, I'm gonna kind of walk us through and looking at a tree in your landscape and trying to make that decision on, do I have a, a risk situation here? Is this tree about to fail um, or is it likely to fail? And how do I know? And how do I, how do I make a decision on whether I need to remove this tree or do some work to this tree? And so it can be a little bit overwhelming, I think. And for people who aren't out in their yard all the time and, and don't look at their trees often and, and maybe just know, don't know what they don't know, I think is probably the best way to define that. Um, it's helpful to have kind of a, a check sheet, a, a kind of a guide to walk your way through. And so that's what we're going to try to focus on today. Let's see if this advances. Oh, great. So before we, we start with this, we want to think about that um, trees are not uh, something bad in the landscape, right? They're a valuable asset. Um, we, we know there's so many benefits to those trees as far as the, the way our home looks, the value to our home. Um, we have also seen studies uh, that show, like from traffic standpoint, cars uh, that travel on residential roads where there's trees that line the side tend to travel slower than when trees are not present. We know that there are also um, uh, studies out there that show that uh, kids, children, our children that maybe have attention deficit disorders when they're in classrooms or in homes with views of trees, then uh, that really helps them to get to a calmer state so they can focus more on, on whatever their tasks are at the time. There's been studies on depression associated with this, homes that are in, uh, let's say, lower income uh, residential areas where there are trees outside tends to bring people into a community more than when it's just barren and, and hot and dry. And of course, that just makes common sense. And so they're a valuable asset. They're not to be looked at, at least I don't think so. And if you're here today, I don't think that you think that either. They're not to be looked at um, as a just a general blanket hazard, right? That we should probably just get rid of these trees because it's dangerous. And many people would get defensive over their trees too. If you, even, even when you have a hazardous tree and that does happen, uh, people may get defensive over that particular tree. And so there's a lot of benefits um, to a tree, but occasionally we have some issues with trees, right? We know that over time, there, our trees are gonna get larger. There's just a natural increase in size. And with a greater size of the tree, we may have, some more concerns, whether they're real or whether we just feel that a bigger tree is going to be of a greater risk. Um, but we want those trees to get bigger because as they age, we get greater benefits from them. Maybe it's a shade tree or maybe it's habitat for birds, whatever those, those things might be. Even fruit trees, for example, as they get older would have, have a benefit to that. And if we don't properly maintain those trees, such as topping trees in this, this program. I've actually presented this once before and I focused a lot on tree topping, but I cut all of that out because I, th I think this audience knows uh, at least what the stance is on tree topping, but obviously it's a negative uh, impact on the tree, but also over mulching trees. And there's lots of things that we can do. And we'll talk more in detail as we go that can increase that risk of failure to the trees. But overall, we don't just think of older trees as as uh, or larger trees as more likely to fail. That's not always the case. Um, larger trees can be structurally strong, and if they don't have any defects, any issues, um, it really comes down to what the carrying capacity is of that tree or its parts. Primarily speaking about the branches and the carrying capacity or that load carrying ability can be in the form of wind, really strong winds, right? Um, straight line winds, tornadoes. Now, once you get into tornadoes, you're kind of throwing all this out the window, but we're talking about what we typically would experience. But also in, in our part of the state um, or part of the country, uh, 
ice loads is probably as big, if not bigger, than snow loads on trees. And so what the capacity of that tree is to be able to, um, to withstand that. And that's not necessarily related to the size of the tree. So it's not necessarily the largest trees that are more likely to fail when we talk about these types of defects in there. And really it comes down to a combination of different things that add together, structural defects and decay, decay the presence of decay, poor structure, or some sort of a uh, unusual um, weather event. And those things all together add up to whether it's a large tree or whether it's a small tree, when it's going to fail. Another concept to kind of think about is when we talk about hazardous trees, the golden rule to the hazardous tree, whether or not it is or isn't, is all related to target. So if there isn't a target for where that tree could fall and cause damage, then we would, we would not term that tree as a hazardous tree. So what are targets? What are some examples of targets? Number one, people. And when we think about trees and we think about the risk, people is the number one concern, right? So are there people in, in your home that could be impacted? Uh, maybe it's a playground or something to that nature where children are going to be, or maybe it's people that you don't know that utilize the, the sidewalk or the street, and, but it's your tree. Is, is there a risk there for that target? people that could be injured. A second one could be property that could be damaged, maybe your home, maybe a storage building, um, or activities that could be disrupted. So here we're talking more like in a, like this, let's say a city park, where a tree provides shade to a picnic area. That's an activity. Um, some other examples might include power lines, vehicles that park in that area. Um, and when we think about this target zone, Typically, we don't see trees fail right at the base, right? They don't typically just uproot and fall over. That happens, but usually it's associated with some major uh, storm event. Typically, what we see is individual branches coming out. But when we talk about the hazard zone, we should look at the base. We should look all the way down to the ground, and we should get a height for that tree, and that may be an estimate, and probably as much as um, maybe not twice the height, but at least one and a half times the height because if a tree was to fail at the base, branches are gonna hit, they're gonna shatter and pieces are gonna fly, right? And so we want to include a zone around that tree to allow for that uh, debris as it scatters. Or if you're on a slope, if your house is on a slope and the tree's gonna fall, it may actually slide or move. So you want, might need more space on the, on the downhill side from that. That is the, uh, the impact zone and that is when when we're looking at whether or not there's a target, that's the area that first needs to be um, reviewed and see. If you don't have anything in that area, then it's not a hazardous tree. It's not going to cause uh, any damage to anything. And so therefore you don't really have an issue. And here's a couple of examples. There's no target for these two trees where they fell. It's in an open area that's unlikely to be used and uh, people are not there. And so these are not hazardous trees. On the other side, are any of these trees hazardous trees? So we think about the targets again. There's three different types of targets. The first one is a static target. So the picture on the right is a picture of a house. Um, static targets are not easily moved. You're not going to move your house uh, because of the tree, right? Now, if you were building a new house, you might move the location to preserve a tree, but that's a different, that's a different situation. So static targets are not moved. Mobile targets are like the one on the left. So we have a street, somewhat busy street with buses and cars and other things. Uh, there are sidewalks there. There might be bike lanes there. Those are all mobile targets. And then the one in the center with the little uh, green bug is a, is a movable target. Could something that might be in that zone, in that one and a half diameter zone, uh, could it be moved? That might be where cars parked. Uh, playgrounds, picnic tables, which we mentioned earlier. All of those are the different types of targets that we could look at. So when we go through these next next portion of this uh, slide, I've got a picture here. Um, I'd like to say this picture of my house. Uh, it's definitely not because uh, I'm a county extension agent, but it is a very, I guess we could say a typical type of situation. We've got a big tree in the front yard of a house, okay? And so the question then, the first question is, is there a target? Yes, there's a target. 
And thinking back to the slide we just looked at, is that target static? Is it mobile or is it movable? Well, this is a static target. We're not going to move that house. Is there anything else in this that could be um, could be an issue? Well, we do have an entrance area, but it looks like the parking is mostly on the right. And actually, I think this might be like a bed and breakfast. There's parking on the right hand side. Um, there's not going to be a lot of traffic. So really, our primary target here is the house. And that is a static target. So then the next question that we have to ask ourselves, and I'm sorry, it's a kind of a wordy slide, is what's the likelihood of impact? And this really comes down to uh, the amount of time that that target is within that occupancy area, how, how long it's going to be within that zone, or the occupancy rate, you might, uh, might determine it that way. So this is your primary component in deciding the likelihood of the impact. And there's basically four ratings. There's very low, low, medium, and high. And I promise I'm trying not to make this very technical, but I think you need to understand this, these steps and, and classifying it because that will really help you make a decision. It's easy to get uh, emotional or it's easy to jump to conclusions, but if you break this down and try to simplify it and look at these four terms in this particular slide and classify that tree and its likelihood of impact if in the end, and we'll get there, in the end, it will help you make a better decision on whether that tree is a hazard or not. So very low sites. These are sites that don't have a lot of people there, or maybe it's a site that's protected by other trees, like in a woodlot. So think here about um, something like a, uh, a trail, um, a woodland trail, right, or a woodlot. Very low impact. It's not, it's not a great risk, right? The next one is a low likelihood of impact, which means it's not likely to impact a target. Um, it might be a, like a little access road that's not, not used very often. It could be a public street, but there's a lot of trees that kind of buffer from the tree of concern, uh, the tree of question. And so if it was to fall, it's probably never going to make it there because the other trees deflected. And then you kind of move up that scale again to medium. It's a slightly greater risk. It's next to a suburban street or it's next to a home. Um, and maybe it has another tree to kind of intervene and, and stop its fail uh, if it was to fall over completely. And then the last one there is high. So this is the fail tree or the part is most likely going to impact uh, the target. So let's go back to our picture again. The likelihood of impact using those four terms, which of those would we choose? Is our likelihood of impact very low, low, medium, or high? So at first, I realized that it's difficult to know the distance from the base of that tree to the house. But just looking at it from just a, a casual observance, um, we, can, we can make an assumption here that it probably would touch the house. If it was to break at the base, it probably would touch the house. Now, is there going to be a lot of people in that area? Um, probably not. It's not a, a public access area. It's a private drive. The parking's over on the side of the house, most likely. So we can't say that it's very low. We probably wouldn't even say that it's low, but we might give it a rating of medium. Um, I don't know that we would go as far as high. If there wasn't a distance there, and let's say it was up next to the corner of the house, that's definitely going to be high but it may be more likely to be something in a medium. Um, okay, so that's, that's the second decision. We know he has a target, and we know that that likelihood of impact on the target is probably, I'm going to say, let's just classify it as medium. Um, in fact, I'm going to write that down, because when we get to the end, we're going to need to know what we decided. So I'm writing down medium. You can write down that if you like. Now, along with that, we have to decide what's the consequences then if it was to fail. So we said it's a medium, uh, let's go back, medium likelihood of impact. So if it was to fail at the base, and we can make an assumption then that it's going to probably hit the front porch and maybe scrape along the front of the house, would you classify that as severe consequence of failure or significant or minor or negligible? In other words, no, no damage whatsoever. I don't think we can say negligible. I think we're probably going to be somewhere between significant and minor. And again, the, this, the assumption here is that we're basing at, uh, we're, we're breaking, the tree's breaking or it gets uprooted right at the ground. Not branches coming out, but right at the ground. 
So let's just say that this is going to be a minor. If you really disagree with me, you can, you can put it in the chat, but I can't read the chat, so you can't disagree with me. We're going to say it's a minor consequence of failure. It's highly unlikely people are going to be outside on that porch during a storm event, which is probably when something like that would happen. Um, and it looks to me in this picture that it probably would just hit that porch is all. So some damage, but fairly minor overall. Okay. Now there's one more piece we've got to figure out, and that's the likelihood of failure. Now this one's a little bit more um, tricky, and we're gonna spend the rest of our time in this presentation talking about that likelihood of failure. This comes down to the defects that the tree may have and the conditions that could increase or decrease, but in our situation here, increase the likelihood of that failure. And what does failure mean? It basically is when it occurs when the stress on a tree or on a tree branch or part of the crown or whatever that part is, when it exceeds the strength of that tree. So just, just to give it an example or put it into more uh, realistic terms, if we're in the middle of, of a storm and we have a lot of wind pressure on that tree, maybe more than it has ever experienced in the past, what we are concerned about is where that stress, when does the stress, exceeds the strength of that tree. Um, so there's no absolute thresholds for this because we don't know. We can't, we can't look inside of this tree. We don't know how much solid wood is there. We, even if we knew it was completely solid wood or just had minor amounts of decay, we don't know um, from research or anything, really, how much is necessary for stability uh, and so therefore our predictions are limited, even though there's been lots of research and there are tools out there to help um, look into the tree and kind of kind of identify how much decay is, has occurred. It's difficult because every tree is a little bit different. And so genetics play a part in that, too. So the defects that we're concerned about here are injuries, uh, the growth patterns, any decay, anything that might reduce the tree's structural strength and it, once we make that determination, we're going to classify it in one of these four ways. Is Firstly, is that it's improbable that the tree or a branch or whatever part of that tree, it's not likely to fail during a normal weather condition, and it's probably not going to fail even during severe weather conditions over a specified time. Remember, as longer the trees live for certain species, they're going to start declining naturally anyway. So say over the next 10 years, what's that tree going to do? And that, that time frame has to be decided and something that you're comfortable with too. And our picture, probably not going to be improbable, right? Possible means failure could occur, but it's unlikely that it's going to occur during no normal weather conditions. The next one is probable. It's expected that something is going to fail on this tree under normal weather conditions. And then the last one be, would be imminent. Uh, that it's already started to fail. We've got parts coming out of the tree. This is getting ready to happen. And I've seen trees like that. You may you may have a tree like this. Uh, back to our picture again, looking at those four terms, is it improbable that it's going to, to fail? Probably not. Is it possible? Yes. Is it probable? Well, nothing that we can see from this picture indicates that it's already in decline. It's got a nice full crown. Uh, but that's all we can really tell from this picture. Uh, we can kind of see at the, at the base of the tree, but it doesn't appear to have started uprooting or heaving. We don't see any cracks from this perspective. So it's possible, uh, it's, but it may not be probable that it's going to happen. And it's certainly not imminent. This tree still looks great. So it's got a lot of life based on this picture uh, still left in it. So I'm going to write down possible uh, as our likelihood of failure. So I've got my three terms and hopefully you've got the same. If you've got different ones, that's fine. I'll show you how to plug them all in here at the end. Now let's go back to this likelihood of failure because to someone just looking at a tree at a distance like we're doing here, this is a very difficult determination to make. We need to know more about the tree. And as we think about other conditions that uh, play into the likelihood of failure, these are some of the categories that you might consider. Site conditions, the tree age and the size, the tree species, and then the tree condition and defects. So when we think about site conditions first, looking at the overall topography, here we have a tree that is on a slope. Not just on a slope, it also has 
looks like some of the soil has been removed on the downhill side because they've built some sort of a structure around the roots. Um, that may change its likelihood of failure. Um, another situation where we tend to see this is, let's say, um, new home construction. It was previously a wood, wooded lot and trees were cleared out, right? Now we have a new forest edge. Um, before the trees extended all the way to the road, we pushed it back about 300 feet, maybe more, 500 feet. And now there's a, a row of trees that never before were exposed on the perimeter of the woods. We have a new forest edge. What's that impact going to be on those trees that were buffered by 500 feet of trees in front of them? Adjacent trees is another concern. So if you have, in this, this picture we just have one, but if we have a lot of trees together and you've got a tree that's already in a failure type mode and it's near this tree, um, is it likely to spread disease? Is it likely to fall on this tree, which might cause this one to topple over? Uh, have there been changes in soil moisture or drainage, new tile dug, those types of things? All of that fits under the site conditions. As a homeowner, uh, you may know what some of those sites are. You may know that uh, the city came in and cut the roots of that tree to put in a new sidewalk. How much is that going to impact the tree? We may not have a full grasp on that. Um, another thing that we can find, you can look online and find kind of the average longevity of certain trees. And so we know that some grow um, very slowly and they may last for very long. This is just a a, a listing of four. So we know that red maples, for example, that under the age of 70 years have a pretty low hazard rate. Um, now, as they get older than that, that starts to go up. And then all the way down to, to, to white oak there under 80 years, you could expect it to be, uh, to be in pretty good health, assuming nothing else has happened to it. So I threw in a couple of pictures here. Here's a, uh, an excavator digging a new pipe for whatever purpose, uh, somewhat near that tree. It looks like we're just outside the drip line, but we know that tree's roots extend at least twice the drip line. That's the outer tips of the branches, twice that distance. So we're certainly impacting the root system of that tree. That's probably going to impact the longevity of that tree. And then certainly in an urban situation where we've got uh, these little tree rings that have been blasted out of the concrete sidewalks, and we're not going to see the same uh, longevity of those trees. That's certainly going to be shorter because it's a much more difficult um, situation to be growing in. So this is kind of a difficult one to, um, to kind of get your fingers on and, and to grasp, but UK has a couple of good pubs, and those will be in the, the chat box. Uh, where you can click on these. Dr. Fountain put these together, which is why we had asked him to, to come and kind of give this presentation, but it really helps um, to look at your tree and kind of see. So I have, uh, I have them here in my hand. The Guide to Appraisal of Tree Species in Kentucky Landscapes is one. And thinking about that picture with the big house and the maple out front, I'm pretty certain that's a sugar maple. And this pub shows that it has a 70 to 80% species rating. So that's not a guarantee, but it just could be used as a guide. And it basically tells us on a scale of, it starts at 10%, 10 to 100% that we are certainly a tree of a better quality than half of the trees in the list. And these are all the trees that are commonly found in the trade in Kentucky. Uh, we're at 70 to 80, that's pretty good. Uh, so we would expect that tree to be a good, longer lasting tree in the landscape. And for comparison, if we looked in this pub for uh, the bottom 10 to 20%, we would find trees like uh, flowering pear, Bradford pear. I don't think we have to talk anymore about that. That kind of is self-explanatory why it would be there. Mimosa is another one. I know it grows up wild in fence rows and some people love mimosa. In fact, I have one that I planted uh, here at the extension office, but it was unique. It was a chocolate mimosa, so it's kind of unique. Um, but they're weak and they're going to fall, fail, and they're probably going to fail much sooner than um, that, that sugar maple in the landscape. The other pub that we have uh, that Dr. Fountain's put together is a species failure profile for trees that are commonly found in the Ohio Valley. And when you look up sugar maple in here, what you're going to find is that it's, its observed frequency of failure is low, like very low. So that's great. 
um, that tree in that picture as we're thinking about it shouldn't have a lot of problems. It's problems that that we would typically find associated with that is codominant branches, and we're going to talk what that what that word means here in just a second. Um, verticillium wilt as far as disease pressure goes. Uh, but what we also know about that particular tree, that genus species of sugar maple, is that usually it goes into decline before it fails. And what that means is you would typically see a lot of dieback in the canopy. And when you see that, then you know that tree is already in a declining state. You wouldn't just typically see it broken over. Um, it would it most often is going to decline before it fails, which gives you more time. The next part that we kind of have to go through is talking about the different tree defects when you're looking at your tree in your landscape. What are clues that you have some issues um, going on with the tree that might cause you to give it a different rating, a different likelihood of failure rating? Okay, so um, I just classify, there's, there's different ways to do this, but I, I call these seven types of tree defects, and we're going to run through these pretty quickly, but number one is dead wood. Uh, that's typically dry, brittle wood. It, sometimes it's unpredictable, but you'll notice it because first you may see a big dead branch in the tree, or you just see a branch that didn't leaf out this year, um, no buds, uh, there may be bark loose that's falling off. The larger that branch is in the canopy, um, and the higher it is above a target, then the greater that risk is going to be. Um, the higher in a tree that the, a dead branch occurs and the larger that it is, the faster the rate of its fall is going to be, assuming it doesn't get snagged by another branch on the way down. And so that's going to greatly increase the, the risk for whatever that target is underneath. Um, I would say that the likelihood of failure for dead branches most likely range from imminent, because it's gonna come out of there eventually, right, to possible. And if you see that in a tree, it doesn't necessarily mean your tree's in decline, it just means it lost a branch, right? And, and there could be a lot of different reasons. Some trees just naturally do that. Uh, I have a tulip poplar tree that uh, seems like we lose branches every year, but the tree's great. It's fully canopied, it's nice and tall, but there's always a branch here or there that's come out of the tree. Um, you need to take action when you get one that's lodged in a tree and hanging. We call those widow makers because um, at a certain height when it falls, if you're the target, um, that you're, that's, that's why it's called a widow maker. Um, if the tree is dead and you've got dead branches, you need to probably take action immediately um, or when it's of significant size to cause problems. So that's, that's number one is looking at dead wood in a tree as a, as a signal, as a sign of deciding the likelihood of failure. Number two is cracks, and this one's a little bit um, more difficult to kind of uh, to, to make a determination about. Sometimes it's pretty obvious, and so what we're talking about with a crack is a separation of the, the wood fibers. That can occur on a branch. Uh, it could occur in the trunk of the tree. Um, sometimes we may find it associated with frost cracks. Uh, I know I looked at a, a redbud tree this spring that was still in full bloom, and a frost crack had occurred and split down the side. And the likelihood of that tree causing a problem was not very high. It was a somewhat new tree. It was small, so there's not really a big issue there. Um, but the tree's health was at stake. It wasn't going to probably make that um, or make it from there. So, but a deep split through the bark that extends through the wood, those are the types of things that we're talking about looking at uh, indicating a tree failure. And anytime that we start to see combinations of these things, so we have a crack and we have another defect in the tree, that ranks it up higher uh, on our list. And so those are the types of things. Sometimes you will see a crack, but then you'll see wound wood. So the, the tree has tried to grow over, uh, grow new tissue over the top of that wound. Um, and that may actually lower that likelihood of risk. It's difficult. It's difficult to say. But just keep, in, keep this in mind. If you look at your trees and you see a crack in the tree, then it's also um, one more kind of a mark against it, right? If you see a crack across where the trunk comes down and then it becomes the roots across that flare, if it's going horizontally across the flare instead of with the flare, that is an imminent threat. That is a root that is breaking. And if it's one of the main anchorage roots, the next big win could be the last uh, big win for that tree. That's one that you would need to take um, action immediately. 
So that's number two is on cracks. Um, here's an example. Sometimes cracks are associated with some sort of decay. So here we've had some old branches that either broke off or were pruned off incorrectly. They never healed. Well, they don't heal. They never compartmentalized. And this crack has curved around and is moving down through the tree. Um, this is uh, the type of decay that you would say is either probable for failure or, or imminent, depending on what it looks like above that. All right, number three, weak branch unions. Um, right for pair lovers, this is where we come into this. Uh, branches are in places where they're not strongly attached to the tree. And so typically on something like in this little video here, we've got branches that are splitting out of the side of the tree. It's usually still a little bit lower risk because this is a smaller tree, but some trees are more prone to this. Uh, trees that grow up and develop a, a fork in the tree, maples are prone to this, ash trees are prone to this. Um, that fork, if the tighter V-shaped fork it is, the greater it risk is of it, the likelihood of that to, to fail. Um, where you might see occasionally a trunks that makes this U-shape, that's actually a little bit stronger. So it should last a little bit longer. Embedded wood is another concern. And that's one of the primary issues with Bradford pears or any of the, any of the flowering pears, ornamental pears, is it's not just these very sharp angles, but the, the trunk here or the branch here and the branch here, both of them had bark and now they're just pushing against each other. They never mesh, the wood never mesh together. And so we call that included bark. And it's basically pushing itself apart as well. So those are all uh, associated to these weak branch unions. And that's number three for helping you to make a decision, right? Um, I threw that in just for a wow factor. I mean, there's a tree that had really bad structure to begin with, and it grew for a long time. But then I think it probably took some sort of downburst to cause that, but it, it definitely pushed it all apart. But you can, you can see on here the included bark. You can see the bark tissue that never meshed and it came apart. Okay, number four is decay. And decay is very difficult to detect. Um, sometimes decay can be occurring for years and years inside of a tree. And it, the, the first evidence that we may see is when mushrooms start showing up on the trunk or what we call a conchs or bracket or shelf fungus showing up on the trunk of the tree. Um, it almost always occurs from the inside out. It may have occurred from a pruning wound or a broken limb. Um, there's a, any number of ways it could have gotten in there, right? Some other indicators besides the fungal, you, I get this call quite often about carpenter ants in trees. Um, carpenter ants don't consume the tree, but they do excavate out that dead wood, what we call doty wood, that, that looser, softer wood, and they make nesting cavities in there. How can they do that if the tree is solid, right? If it has a solid core, it doesn't. So obviously there's some decay, even if the mushrooms haven't even started to show up. And when you take that decay and you associate it with what we've talked about so far, cracks, weak branches, dead branches, those types of things, then we start to rank this up a lot higher on that likelihood of, of failure. Okay, so that's decay. Next are cankers. Um, that's an area where it's usually caused by a disease. Um, or it could be caused by mechanical um, damage. I would classify something like Southwest trunk injury as a canker where the, the tissue on that side during the winter time became active and then the cell tissue um, died because there was no water to feed those cells. And then it kind of uh, caved in and it didn't regrow. And you've got this, this big canker on the outside and then new diseases could come in after that. But that's a, that's a canker. Um, when you have a canker that is more than a third of the tree's circumference, we have lost a lot of structural integrity of that tree and it needs to be addressed, um, especially if you find a crack or something else associated with it. It's, it needs to be addressed quickly. And number six is on root problems. So symptoms that you might see here with root problems or twig dieback, some deadwood in the tree, smaller leaves, it's, it's, uh, it's somewhat unpredictable on how the tree is going to respond to those. Um, when we see soil lifting, when we see a tree leaning and soil is now lifting, that's a serious um, condition and something that needs to be addressed quickly. Some of the types of, of uh, root issues that, that, that I see pretty often 
are a buried root collar. So again, going back to the trunk going down and then the roots flaring out, that's supposed to be at the surface. Sometimes, especially during new home construction in a wooded lot, to get the lot level, more soil is brought in and backfilled around these trees. And now instead of coming down and sloping out, it comes down into the ground like a telephone pole. And that's not right. And if you excavate and dig out around that tree, it could be as much as a foot of soil that has been added around the trunk of the tree. That is guaranteed to result in root decline and root death. And usually it's been a few years whenever I'm called out to look at that tree. And I remember one in particular on a tulip poplar tree that looked like a telephone pole going in and it had been buried that way for over five years. And it had lots and lots of what we call epicormic growth or these little branches coming out of the trunk and leaves for a tulip poplar are typically like this size. And we're talking tulip poplar leaves a foot to 18 inches in size. Uh, that's the tree's last ditch effort to try to build up enough energy reserves to, to live. And it was definitely not going to live at that point. Stem girdling can be another issue too. That can happen from a... Um, a girdling root that has circled around the trunk of the tree. That's another common issue we typically see when we go out and make tree visits. But it could be somebody, let's assume it wasn't you, it was a previous homeowner that uh, had a chain wrapped around there for their dog outside. I don't know, whatever, some rope for a playground thing, and nobody ever took it off. And it has girdled that tree right around the, the base of the tree. Um, sometimes we'll see flat areas. So we've got this nice flare, and then we have a flat side to the tree. Um, that may be an indicator of either a girdling root or some obstruction underground, um, maybe a big rock or something that was there before, and it uh, is not able to grow out or around or above that. And then finally, we might see some oozing out of the, uh, the roots. That's a sign of some sort of root disease that's occurring. So those are the types of things associated with, with, uh, with root issues. And then the last one is just poor tree architecture. Um, that can happen... I'll tell you here at our site, at our extension office, I don't, we're like in a wind tunnel out front. Every tree that I have planted, all of them have this little slight lean to them. And a lean is okay. Uh, it, trees can lean, but when they start to lean excessively, then we are um, getting into a condition where uh, anything else that gets added to that uh, will cause some greater, greater concern of, of it failing, right? And so, if a tree leans excessively, or if you get a, a pruning because of power lines or any other reason, and, and there's no branches on this side, and all the branches are now on, on in crown on one side of the tree, that's a, a greater, greater risk. Sometimes trees will self-correct, and so they'll start out maybe at a lean, but over time they curve and kind of go back, and you can see it in the tree, this kind of a, a curve in that. Um, that can be okay. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a hazardous tree, um, but those, those, that's just the last thing. And sometimes there's nothing you can do about that. Um, it's just the way that it grew. But it's certainly something to pay attention to when we're looking at the different types of tree, uh, tree defects. So we're actually almost to the end, but what I wanna do now is take all those terms that we just talked about and kind of plug this into something for you. Um, the ISA, which is the International Society of Arboriculture, has a form for basic tree risk assessment. And um, you, let me just say very clearly <laughs> that this training today does not qualify you as a tree risk assessor. And I'm not qualified as a tree risk assessor. We're just looking through the, the things that they want homeowners to consider. Ultimately, whatever the decision is on that tree, whether it needs to be removed um, is, is your decision, it's your tree. And there's a couple of sl slides following about what happens with those decisions. But to help you make that determination, let's go back and look at those terms and plug them into these little matrices that they have uh, with this tree risk assessment form. You can get online, just Google that term, and you can find, uh, if you Google ISA basic tree risk assessment form, and you can use that for your home use and try to make a de decision. But I would say, if you feel like the target and the risk is more than what you're comfortable with, that you should probably contact a professional. And ISA would be the professionals in this, in this field and having a certified arborist come out 
who has been trained on tree risk assessment and actually doing this form for real, not just for practice or for our own benefits, uh, would be very helpful. But let me show you how these, these plug in. So we looked at the likelihood of impact first, and the terms that we had associated with that was very low, low, medium, and high. I don't know if this will show if I move my mouse here. Yeah. So very low, low, medium, and high likelihood of impact. And I had written down medium for this picture that we've been talking about today. The likelihood of failure, we were limited on knowing that because we can only see this tree from the road. But based on what we see on this picture, we put it, or I put it as a possible. So if you take possible and you go across to medium, the likelihood of impact was unlikely. So we're gonna take that term unlikely and move it to this matrix, likelihood of, of failure and the impact, and we go down to unlikely. And then we can move across and look for the consequence for failure, which we put as minor. And what you'll see is that it's low. So if this was your tree and if this was your house, you could feel confident looking at this picture that, or you might feel confident that it's the consequence of it falling, that the chances of this tree impacting the house is pretty low. And hopefully that would help you rest a little easier. Now, the results may not come out that way. And in fact, if you look, I don't know if I can do this correctly uh, on the fly like this, but if you had... Um, it's possible to get something up in this zone that it gives you an unlikely, but then, well, it's not possible with unlikely, I'm sorry, somewhat likely. Um, but then if you move down here and the, the damage is significant, uh, then, then that would move it up into a moderate. And if it was very likely or likely, that would put it into a high. And of course, the top end is extreme. So here's a tree that's already in decline it is a tree that's extreme. The form that you would be looking for online, if you, if you want to try to do this on your own, looks like this. And again, it's the basic tree risk assessment form. I just want you to be clear that this is just kind of a guide. It's just kind of trying to help you make a decision about the tree. And if you walk through those defects, if you walk through what the targets are, what the impact likelihood would be, what sort of consequences it would be, it will help you quantify these, these um, fears and put them into a rating scale that, at least for me, can really help in making a decision on whether or not that tree comes has, needs to come down, or maybe just a decision on whether or not you need to have a professional come and evaluate that tree. Remember that the final decision is yours on whether the tree comes or goes. Um, there is a couple of other things to be concerned about, are you liable if your tree falls? So um, what the rules state on that is if a tree is in your yard and it falls and let's say it damages your neighbor's property and you don't have any prior knowledge of, the, of any hazards with the tree, then typically your neighbor's general policy is going to cover that damage, but this could be easily disputed. And so you wouldn't, you wouldn't, uh, I think the purpose of this slide is to say sticking your head in the sand and not paying attention to your trees doesn't uh, get you out of trouble, okay? So pay attention to the trees that you have. It's better to know if you have issues with your trees and address those issues than avoiding it completely. It's not always going to work out to your advantage. Uh, and then one other question that sometimes comes along with that is how long does it take for a standing tree to fall after it dies? And that's very difficult to determine. With the sugar maple example that we have in this presentation, typically you're going to see small twigs, branches are going to die, fall, start falling out first, uh, and then maybe larger branches, and then ultimately the trunk. This is not in a situation of a storm event. This is just average weather, regular weather, what you would typically find. But that's not always the case. And, and I know you've seen that after big storms, uh, driving around and seeing total trees uprooted. Um, but that, that can happen too. But typically there was something else. There could have been a clue to one of those defects before um, to know whether or not that tree was headed that way. So that's what I have to present today. I hope that that's been helpful. And uh, I think I can stop share here in a second. And then if there's any questions, I'll do my best to answer them.